Hey everybody, today I am out in snowy Utah taking a look at my favorite mid-size truck in America for 2024. This is the all-new Ford Ranger and we have finally been able to drive it. Now, this is my favorite, but is it the best mid-size truck in America for you? Let's try and find out because that will largely depend on exactly what you expect of your mid-size truck. what's new about the Ranger? Well, basically everything except the engine lineup. And the engine lineup is one huge reason to get the Ranger over the competition. But let's talk about the styling first. Obviously, mid-size truck here, so smaller than an F-150. Also designed to look still rugged, but maybe a little bit more car-like. And that's because the Ranger is not just sold in North America, it's sold around the world in every market that Ford sells practically. This model is a fairly loaded Lariat trim. We're gonna take a look at the Ranger Raptor in a separate video. That's gonna be live two days after this one, so be sure and check that out. Obviously the front end is gonna change a little bit based on the different trims that you look at, but full LEDs here, LED projector highs, LED lows, and LED fog lights there, and then LED DRLs and turn signals as well. Now, as we move around to the side of this, uh, keep in mind Travis is there behind the camera, so hopefully he won't slip as we start looking around this Lariat. You'll notice that we get a style of the cab that certainly is in keeping with some of Ford's international products. So a little bit less boxy than we find in the F-150. It's not just a miniaturized F-150. Big change for this year is that it's only gonna come one way with the cab you're looking at here and the bed you're looking at behind. That means this is gonna be smaller and easier to park than the largest Tacomas out there, but you will find more variation in that Toyota Tacoma lineup, mainly because Toyota sells more mid-sized trucks in North America at this time. So if you want a short cab, you want a two-person cab, or if you want a long bed behind, you'll find those details in that lineup. I'll let Travis move around to the rear while I turn on the turn signals here so you can see one touch that I really like out back, and that is that we actually get amber turn signals, something that I honestly hadn't expected, but these are not full LEDs back here. What do you think about that, Travis? We have the brake light and parking light up here, the amber turn signal, and then really nothing going on down there other than a reflector and the backup light. You know, I like to see more light if the whole, you know, component is there. And at this point, the fact that the lower half just doesn't seem to illuminate at all is really disappointing. Yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and grab the camera from you so you can be our Vanna White over here with the, uh, the back end of this Ford uh, because we have some new touches back here in this Ranger. The first thing you're going to notice is that step over there. It is deeper than it was before. Uh, it's actually a new design, they're saying, so that way you can get into the bed a little bit easier. That's a nice touch, and you will find it on either side. And this I definitely model, have bigger feet, so being able to yeah. fit in there comfortably is a good thing. Uh, let's, let's go check out the one on the other side there. Go in for a closer look. Go ahead. Yep, there we go. That's pretty good there. And uh, everything's now, about the right height. It's an easy grab up here. It's an easy step up here. So if you do need to reach something, there are options. Yeah, this one has the hitch over there. It's rated to tow up to 7,500 pounds when properly equipped. Yeah. So Travis, what do you think about this half chrome, half black bumper? I kind of dig the look. You know, it's not too busy. A lot of people like chrome, especially on their trucks. I like that you can clearly see where we've got our parking sensors here. That's going to be easily replaceable if you need it. Um, overall, I like the, the extra splash of chrome in a segment that's gone a lot more black trim than anything yeah. else. Now let's uh, let's pop this tailgate down here. First thing you notice, uh, it is damped, which is a nice touch. Mm -hmm. What else do we notice in here? So we have one of the wider beds in the segment. The only other vehicle in, in the midsize truck category that is this wide is the Honda Ridgeline, and yeah. that is a very different kind of truck. So this is just over 48 inches wide between the wheel wells, and that means this is one of the few trucks where you can put four by eight sheets of things between those wheel wells rather than on top. That makes this bed considerably more practical. And that's perhaps the biggest reason that I like the Ranger a little bit more than some of the competition. Now, what do you think about the styling as we close that up? Are, are you more uh, Team Tacoma or more Team Ranger? It's a really tough mix. I think the lights on the Ranger here have me. If I say everything else is fairly similar, just the presence on the road and when you walk out to it or you look at it in the rear view mirror, I think I'm leaning towards the Ranger right now. Yeah, I like the front end design, but I do have to say, I think that the, uh, the Toyota has a slightly more aggressive front end, that sort of meaner, you know, more angular grill there. This is that interesting blend of, of truck meets uh, car, perhaps in the Ford lineup, as I was saying. Now I'm just gonna hand you this back and then we'll talk about what's going on under the hood because this is the biggest reason that I like 
the Ranger more than the competition. We have not one, not two, but three different engines to choose from under this hood. They're all turbocharged, so if you're not a fan of turbocharged engines, sorry, you're gonna have to shop somewhere else, but we get heaps and heaps of power. We also have the only 10-speed automatic in this segment, and you're gonna find it with every engine. This is the base 2.3 liter turbo. It's pretty familiar, produces about 270 horsepower, but you can also get the 2.7 liter twin turbo V6 out of the F-150 in your Ranger if you want to. And then of course, tomorrow, I'm gonna to be driving the Ranger Raptor. That video is again coming out two days after this one. That shoehorns a just over 400 horsepower three liter twin turbo V6 from the Lincoln lineup right here under this hood. And of course, it's gonna give you Raptor levels of performance in a miniaturized size. I love the 10 speed automatic transmission from Ford. It doesn't just improve fuel economy, it also improves towing and hauling capability because it has so many more gear ratios available. It just means that the engine has a ratio really for every occasion. This is definitely one of the places where the Ranger has a bit of an advantage over some of the competition, not just in the 10 speed, but the fact that you can get so many variations of the powertrain. We are in the Lariat, we're in the top trim, but we're in a two wheel drive with the 2.3 not the 2.7, so you can have your pick of features and not just have to go big all the way. Yeah, it is uh, It is the rear wheel drive, and yes, it is um, pretty snowy right now, actually, in this little spot, so we are very thankful that we pulled off and uh, we have the all-terrain tires on this one. So far, so good. Now, one thing we also don't have on this or in any Ranger is a hybrid system. If you want a hybrid truck, you're gonna have to get yourself a Maverick, and that is something that we find in the Toyota lineup, but we haven't driven it yet. No, and it's one of those things where the segment is getting a little bit split. We have naturally aspirated V6. This is going to be all turbo. Toyota is going towards hybrid very strongly. And if you have a strong preference on what powers the machine, not just the numbers, then you're kind of getting put into some, some separate manufacturers. Yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's go inside and take a look and see what the inside looks like. All right, the interior is definitely uh, warmer inside than it is outside, but you'll notice it is a fairly compact interior. I'm actually gonna grab something to clean that lens because it does look a little bit wet. So, uh, sorry everybody. It's like your mother licking, licking the napkin and you know doing the whatever, but let's take a look at the interior here. So, obviously, brand new interior in a brand new Ranger. Uh, the interior materials are going to change depending on the version of this that you get. Um, so I know that you weren't able, Travis, to spend too much time in the lower end trim that they had inside, but mm -hmm. you will notice that there are a few differences. The biggest and weirdest one for me actually is over here on your side of the vehicle, and that's that the lower end trims do not get this twin glove box setup that we find in full size trucks. I think that's actually a really great feature and I really wish it was standard. Um, we do have a sizable, a uh, little slot there where you could put your smartphone. Not quite big enough to put some of those larger smartphones in their cases, but you could definitely do that up there in that storage compartment. For me, this is a great place to forget your phone because once it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Okay, yeah, I could see that. But then again, you know, it's a place where thieves aren't gonna see your phone. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the air vents? I love this style, that these individual little elements move like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very small touch, but one that I enjoy is, you know, it's more dynamic, it's more interesting. Uh, as they turn, you get a slightly different shape. Overall, I think this is a nice touch, and it mimics sort of what you see in a grill, mm -hmm. which is a nice thing to bring into the cabin. Now we have the big touchscreen infotainment system, borrowed, of course, from the Mustang Mach-E. It's the first vehicle we, we really saw this large screen format in. Mm -hmm. But there are actually two different screens, right? Yeah, and this is going to be the bigger of them. And at this point, we're getting into a category that has lots of features. And so a larger screen seems like something you would definitely want. If you don't get the big one, it only gets a little bit smaller, though. Yeah, I mean, the, the one, the screen that we have in the, uh, the Tacoma, I'm a little torn as to whether I like this vertical format or the horizontal format a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Let's just go ahead and, and pair a phone here while we, uh, while we wait, see how this goes. So let's go ahead and phone list here. It does support wireless CarPlay, which uh, is pretty easy, of course, to use. So uh, I'll just go ahead and hunt for that one. Oh, we've found the Ranger. There we go. Let's go ahead and pair. Yeah, sure, why not? There we go. Got lots of talking. Actually, that was a little faster than some of the la later, uh, newer vehicles that have been in recently. Yeah, no hiccups um, either. Yeah, pretty simple. Uh, whoops. Oh, oh, look at me. I hit the disable CarPlay button too fast on the fingers. Let's see if we can resurrect ourselves. Oh, 
that was actually a pretty easy switch. I know some cars you have to completely unpair to actually go back there. And all the um, responses are pretty quick. Yeah, seem to be pretty quick. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nice touches here uh, is that we do see a pretty widescreen format version of CarPlay. It occupies a decent amount there. Mm -hmm. The rest of this, though, is not the new digital Ford experience thing that we find in the Explorer. I, I have to admit I'm a little bit bummed by that. Yeah, I mean, I think at some point you're looking at the sync system being mm -hmm. phased out, but for is, 2024, yeah. it seems like the, the Ranger might be one of the last models to get that transition because this interior brand new, is yeah. basically brand new and updated. It's not to say they can't do it later, but for now, it seems like this is not going to be the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of different camera views. That's a nice touch. Uh, you know, forward looking camera views, back camera views, side by side camera views, but lots of snow. But because of the format of the screen, you'll notice that the actual screen image is going to be a bit bigger in some of those horizontal format screens. But yeah. you can be doing this and then your climate controls, uh, you know, still down there. And you do get dual climate controls. So you have yeah. your, your software based and your hardware based and there is a little bit of overlap and I'm not sure why exactly that is but it is there and um, if you have a preference you have options. Yeah and I like the fact that we get those physical buttons down there for that climate control. Mm -hmm. They were pretty proud of some of the storage spaces. Keep in mind this is a mid-sized truck but mm -hmm. it has a transmission the same size as the one in the F-150 right down there. Uh, what's under that little cubby? Oh, a little storage there. A little not storage. Too not too bad. We have a 12 volt outlet down there. There's plenty of room. This is not an enormous you know, cabin, mm -hmm. um, but I think they've done pretty well with the variety, if not the overall volume of storage. Now down here, we also have the drive mode selector, even in models without four wheel drives that threw us off a little bit when we were selecting the vehicle to go out driving in. We still have a rear locker available though, auto start stop there. This is the autonomous parking system, electric parking brake right there, and a pretty traditional console shifter. Interestingly, we have two different LCD instrument clusters. This is the larger one. You'll find this in the upper end trims, and you'll find a slightly smaller eight inch display in the lower end trims, but we do get a reasonable amount of LCD love. And the design of this software is actually pretty similar to what we find in uh, the larger trucks in Ford's lineup. We also get some of the larger truck trailering stuff. You can use this to run through the lights on your trailer so that way you can make sure they're all hooked up correctly, et cetera. And this has the same trailer backup assistance system available that you find in the larger F-150. The steering wheel, I was actually surprised. I don't know about you, Travis, but I was kind of surprised it's not just an F-150 wheel. Yeah, at this point, there's enough carryover. This is a large enough vehicle. There's enough space inside. It seems like it would make sense to go ahead and, and cross that over. Um, but to have its own unique wheel, mm -hmm. I guess, is a choice. And if you hated the F-150 wheel, good news, it's not in here. Yeah, and I think this may be because, again, a little bit more coordination with some of those other world market Fords. So we have the controls for things like the adaptive cruise control speed limiter over here. And then we have the infotainment controls split on the uh, steering wheel. So track forward, backward, volume up, down. And then these controls relate to that multifunction cluster over there. Uh, then on this side, we find some more premium materials on the upper portion of the dashboard. You won't find that in the base trim. So it's sort of a soft touch upper there. We also find a soft touch upper section on the door that's not in the base interior either. So lots more hard plastics in that model. This Lariat trim has sort of a, I don't know, gray kitchen, kitchen counter for mica thing going on there. Soft touch inserts there and then harder plastics down lower on the door. Seems like there's a reasonable amount of storage for a truck in this segment, but you know, again, keep in mind, this is a mid-sized truck. It's not a full-size truck, so obviously there's gonna be less room in here. As far as front seat comfort goes, we haven't had too much time in the Ranger so far, but I do find this front seat a little bit more comfortable than the ones in the competition, especially the new Tacoma. The seating position in the Tacoma has really improved. Uh, I will say this is still a tiny bit more traditional truck-like. Now, we don't have a moonroof here, but as you can see, still plenty of headroom. If I put the seat all the way down, we get even more. But if I wanted a more upright, more, I guess, truck-like seating position, I guess you'd say, you can certainly do that here. Tilt telescopic steering column also has a surprisingly large range of motion there. So I think it's gonna be easier for shorter and taller drivers to find a solid driving position. And instead of a two position memory on the driver's door, we find a three position memory. Uh, I was actually uh, kind of surprised by that, but it is the same module that Ford uses in a decent number of vehicles. Now, let me go ahead and check out the rear seat. Now, the, uh, the tricky bit here is that I'm going to have to move some luggage because we have all of our stuff in here. So that's just gonna have to, you know, hang out in the snow outside. Uh, sorry, bag. Uh, and then we'll leave the computer up front. See how that goes, leave another computer up front. 
more camera bags. Um, we'll talk about pricing later, but there's our window sticker. Um, and then uh, while we're looking behind the seat, this model has the optional subwoofer there. Uh, we have a 100% folding rear seat. Uh, this is a little bit different than we've seen in the Ranger before. So you can either fold this seat down. Uh, Travis might need to adjust his seat. Uh, one thing, again, keep in mind, it is a small truck, so dimensions are a little bit compact. Uh, we have the fold-down armrest there with two cup holders, and you can also fold the seat bottom cushion up and then have access to the storage here underneath. This is where we find the tire iron. The jack is actually behind the seat, and we find these two storage wells. One thing I noticed immediately is that in the new Tacoma, the way this seat stays in this position is they have a little webbing piece and then some snaps, just like snaps on my coat right here. And that's all that holds the seat bottom cushion up. And it is just tied to the fabric of the seat. So I see that actually as kind of a long-term durability problem. Hopping in the back here, reasonable amount of headroom going on. Actually, this is definitely more comfortable than the last Ranger I was in. Um, maybe about an inch of room here. Um, keep in mind it is narrow, so we don't find a whole lot of width, of course, in the back. Now, this is a brand new frame for the Ranger, so it is a little bit wider than before, but most of the width changes for the frame actually were to push those wheel wells out a bit further and to accommodate the bigger engines under the hood. So we don't get an enormous improvement in terms of the cabin width inside. Some hard plastics there at the top of the rear doors, softer plastics around where your arms are gonna go, but keep in mind, this is also a less expensive truck. Now, if I grab the, uh, the camera here from Travis, uh, we do have a power rear window. Ford was really happy with that. We also have center head restraint there for the center passenger, but of course, if you are planning on putting child seats, this has the funky setup where the top tether anchor those are hanging out back there behind these seats. That is a little bit more uh, complicated to actually uh, install a child seat. But a surprising amount of legroom is going on here. So Travis, go ahead and adjust that seat so you're comfortable. Uh, Travis is up there at six feet tall. Ah! No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> sorry, we are running on very little sleep here. Um, <laughs> Lots of coffee, if you hadn't noticed, but very, very little sleep. So I, uh, my knees are almost touching the seat. Um, my feet, there's actually a reasonable amount of foot room there. How are you doing up there as far as room? So room up here, I do have the seat all the way down as well. So that would probably uh, make the rear uh, foot room for you a little bit tighter. This is overall pretty good. I will say from the passenger side, the fact that I can't adjust my seat cushion a little bit oh, more is a little bit disappointing. Down? It'll move up and down, but I don't get any pitch. And so it's uh... a little benchy. Not overly uncomfortable, but a little benchy, and so I have to stretch out quite a ways for my legs to actually sit up against the uh, cushion. Interesting. Lots of headroom there, it looks like. Yep. Again, keep in mind, no moonroof in this particular model. Yep. Uh, but we do have height adjustable shoulder belts. That's kind of a nice touch there. If you do plan on putting folks in the back, they might appreciate the AC inverter outlet there, 400 watts. You get also one outlet in the bed. Over here, we have some USB charge-only ports, but oddly enough, no rear passenger air vents in the rear. When well, we're talking about quirky details inside, we have a well-integrated trailer brake controller right there between the infotainment system and the steering column, but check out where the start button is. It's on that interestingly little angled pod on the steering column because clearly the steering column is designed for a crank key, not just keyless go. Alrighty, let's get the Ranger out on the road. The first thing I noticed is that the ride quality is definitely better than the outgoing model, but you seem to prefer the ride quality in the Tacoma. You know, I'm not entirely sure between the two. Uh, we did drive a number of those Tacomas with a bunch of different mm -hmm. suspension configurations. I can just say that this does eat up the bumps pretty well. I just feel like at least one of those trims on the Tacoma was a little bit more comfortable. And I will agree with that. The, the one trim, if you get the limited with the adaptive suspension system and the coil springs in the uh, in the Tacoma, that actually has a really great ride quality, and it is the only adaptive suspension system in this segment. Uh, the uh, nav system is talking to us now, turning right here. Apparently, the road is closed, so we're going to go a slightly different route. Uh, now, unfortunately, because of the altitude and because of the snow, we haven't been able to do any preliminary zero to 60 testing in this vehicle. Uh, the open and straight areas that we had access to with the right speed limits, it just wasn't safe to do that. But the last time we drove the Ranger, uh, we got a zero to 60 time of about 6.4 seconds. I would expect this is gonna be basically the same in the 2.3 liter turbo model. The 10 speed automatic transmission is definitely an asset for the Ranger, but interestingly, it has been for a while because this engine and transmission, they've been here for a while. Yeah, it's one of the few things that have really carried over on this 
all new model. And I, I have to say it's probably a strength overall. You know, yeah. I, I mentioned it earlier, it's nice to have the engine options and especially with the different configurations where you don't have to get the top engine to get the top trim. Now we are actually stopped. <laughs> First gear. And then there's sort of a bit of a pause. Yeah. Second gear, bit of a pause, third gear. So there is a little bit more of a torque reduction between gears than we find in some of the competition. It's a it's a micro layover yeah, between yeah. shifts. And that's done mainly to improve clutch lifetime in the transmission. Um, I find it actually interesting that Toyota chose not to put the 10 speed in the Tacoma because they have the 10 speed around. I mean, they've got it in the, the Tundra. And I had honestly expected it to be in this generation of the Taco, um, especially since Ford's had this 10 speed here for a while. It, it also, this drivetrain also comes across as smoother than the one in the Tacoma. That's obviously the elephant in the room. It's why we're talking about it so much here. Um, but this 2.3, it's quieter. So if I just put this in neutral and just rev it, you know, it doesn't come across as gruff. It's definitely no. more demure. Yeah. Not everybody's going to want a quieter engine necessarily. Some people might want their engine to be a little bit louder. Um, and of course, if you want that V6 sound, you will still get it in here and you won't in the Tacoma. I think if folks want a, a more pronounced, you know, audible experience, they're really looking for a revving V6, not a revving V4. Yeah. And so the four cylinder here, I do think is a, a little more tame. Um, and I think that just adds to the quality of the experience because the, the sound of these four cylinders in these trucks is not particularly pleasing to begin with. So I don't necessarily need more of it. Yeah, and uh, you know, we're gonna certainly be seeing a lot more of that four cylinder sound. The rumor mill keeps telling us that that that's the direction everybody else is gonna go. We, of course, already have four cylinders in the GM uh, Twinsies. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have it in the Tacoma now. Uh, rumor mill says that we're probably gonna get a four cylinder engine only lineup in the Gladiator at some point, which really just leaves the, uh, the two sort of outliers in this segment with the V6 in the Honda, which a lot of people don't really think belongs in the segment. And of course the Nissan Frontier with its naturally aspirated V6. Now that one does have a lot of power. So over 300 horsepower standard in that Frontier, but this interior feels so much more modern. It really does. And it's still fairly simplistic, but it's got just enough of, of the right touches mm -hmm. to, to keep it interesting. You know, there's enough patterns, there's enough material changes, especially here in the Lariat trim. Um, overall, this is definitely a nice place to be. Yeah, you know, and then uh, we should touch on fuel economy here. We obviously have not been driving this for an enormous period of time, yeah. uh, but other people have been driving this for the previous few days here. And again, we're at 6,000 feet, so we're definitely up here at elevation. We've been averaging 21.2 miles per gallon. That is way higher than I thought this would average, especially since it's been idling for you know, our entire photo Quite shoot a bit of it, yeah. initially. Uh, and other people, we remote started it. We just had it hanging out there to warm the cabin because it is pretty chilly outside. So I'm, I'm generally impressed with that number. Yeah, and so far we've just climbed up and we haven't really mm -hmm. come back down. So I would expect to see better fuel economy in your day-to-day -day use. Um, and, and with the smaller engine, that's what you would hope for. Yeah. Um, I, if, if you saw the same thing in the 2.7, uh, I would be pretty shocked. But for the moment, you know, this, this would probably be the engine that I'd take a look at. Now, to, speaking of small engines, this is a relatively shallow downhill here. Uh, third gear is as low as it will let us go. It's barely able to keep just the truck speed under control. We're actually slightly speeding up here. So if you do plan on towing 7,500 pounds with your Ranger, uh, keep in mind, you're not going to get as much engine braking in this as you would in something like a Frontier because it has that naturally aspirated V6. But, you know, the, the power and the torque curve in here is going to be better because especially at altitude like this, we have the advantage of the turbocharger, heaps of torque, a really, really flat torque plateau. Um, it's just going to be a better companion, I would say. Um, the nine speed automatic in the Frontier, I know you haven't driven it yet, but I, I do like that nine speed. It's actually a Mercedes nine speed design. Um, I don't know what long-term repair costs are going to run on that transmission because of its Mercedes heritage. We generally know about this transmission though, and this has been a bit more expensive than Ford's six-speed in the previous generations of their truck lineup. Um, but those costs do seem to be going down because this transmission is everywhere in the Ford and GM lineup. They're using it in so many different vehicles that that's really helping drive down those long-term dependability and maintenance costs. Yeah, I mean, the more miles it sees, the more vehicles it's in, the more mm -hmm. simple, easy, repairable, parts accessible that you're gonna find. And so 
if it is not the most reliable transmission, it's certainly good enough. Now, if you want a bit more power and ostensibly perhaps a bit more fuel economy, then Toyota is promising a lot, of course, in the new iForce Max drivetrain in the Tacoma. That's their new 2.4 liter turbocharged hybrid model. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very different hybrid from the only other hybrid that's kind of sorta in this segment, which is the Maverick. Yep. Uh, now the Maverick, the bed is a little bit smaller, the interior is a tiny bit smaller, but we're really talking about shades of gray as far as size goes. And two-wheel drive only. Yes, two-wheel drive only, big mm -hmm. thing. But, and front-wheel drive, yep. I guess, but 40 miles per gallon. Um, we yeah. don't know Tacoma fuel economy specs yet, but we know them in the Land Cruiser. And um, what do you think? Underwhelming. Yeah, 23 miles per gallon in that model. And for the record, again, 6,000 feet, we have been averaging 21.2 miles per gallon Without in this hybrid. non hybrid model. Yeah, lots of idling, lots of engine just hanging out there doing nothing. Yeah. Um, I am going to hope that due to the general dimensions of the Tacoma, maybe it's a little bit better than Land Cruiser. It certainly could be. Uh, but you know, I think it's probably going to be pretty similar. If at that, with the Land Cruiser as a point of reference, 25 would be great. 25 I'd love would to be great. See 25. Yeah. So, and the one thing I will caution everybody out there, again, we haven't driven it. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be driving it though in Land Cruiser very, very soon. So yep. stay tuned. If you haven't already subscribed, be sure and subscribe because we're definitely going to make some inferences to the upcoming taco. Uh, but you know what? It's based on the same hybrid system that I'm already not the hugest fan of in Toyota's lineup. Mm -hmm. And that would be the one in the Tacoma and in the Sequoia. Uh, sorry, the Tundra and the Sequoia. Yeah. Um, you know, the single motor, regular rear wheel drive transmission setup that they have there, it feels less refined than the F-150 hybrid system, which is the same sort of general principle, mm -hmm. but Ford's had a bit more time to work on the software, and I think that's the biggest uh, drawback I have in their system. Mm -hmm. I am a tiny bit surprised that Ford, however, did not put that F-150 hybrid in this. At least not yet. You know, mm -hmm. this is a carryover on the, most of the powertrains. We do see something a little bit different on the Ranger Raptor for the Ranger model, but hopefully in a couple years, it's something that they can bring. Obviously, mm -hmm. they have the ability to bring it. It's whether or not the market says they exactly. ought to bring it. And so it's not just how the mm -hmm. Tacoma sales do on the hybrid model, but I think how much Ford feels like they need to compete with that. That'll yeah. really determine if and when we see that. Because we can paint a lot of pictures. I mean, this is the same 10 speed, and the same three liter V6 under the hood that you find in, you know, I don't know, a uh, Lincoln Aviator plug-in hybrid. <clears throat> and uh, if it fits in the Aviator, it would probably fit in this exact same transmission tunnel one space. One could assume, yeah. One, one would logically make some guesses there. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, they could always downsize the engine, go with the 2.3. Yeah, and like <laughs> I said, we haven't driven that Tacoma hybrid, but with a hybrid, if it's not geared towards more efficiency, then I would certainly hope it's geared towards more performance. Yeah. That's going to be your torque on the low end as a big part of it. Um, and tricky bit there, I mean, the 2.7 liter turbo here uh, already produces incredibly competitive performance figures versus that expected performance figure in the Tacoma. Keep in For mind, sure. it's going to be heavy too. Yeah. Still has the turbo, extra weight, etc. cetera. So, um, you know, I would actually be a little surprised if that engine actually managed to match the 2.7 liter turbo's performance in this. Uh, and then you have the reality that when that small battery pack is depleted, say you're towing, you're going up a steep hill, yeah. you know, you're going to be left with just the power output from that 2.4. And of course here, you're going to get all that 2.7 liter all twin turbo time. goodness. Yeah. Um, and it is going to be available in those two different trims here. It's not just reserved for the top end trim. You don't have to get the Raptor to get extra oomph. Right. And I think it's worth saying that not only are we impressed with this particular engine as it is, but so far Ford has put together a pretty competitive lineup when it comes to powertrains. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I will uh, end with here is that in addition to the ride quality being solid, uh, we obviously haven't been able to test grip because it's been slushy, it's been wet, you know, there are flakes flurrying around here, etc. So it's just not the wisest thing to do. But it does have a solid feel to it. Like I, I do like the connection to the steering. It's a little bit better than the previous generation of the uh, the Ranger, as one would logically expect. I think they've done just a decent job just integrating everything, um, making it feel a little bit tighter, a little bit easier to drive out on the road, a little bit more engaging than before, but it is still at its core, a body on frame truck. Yep. Before I forget, Quickly, if you haven't hit the subscribe button down there, do so now. Hit the notification icon as well, and please find us over at Facebook. 
All of those things definitely help us get access to new vehicles like the Ford Ranger and of course the Ford Ranger Raptor. Also set your alarm clock of course because again for the umpteenth time Ranger Raptor coming about two days after this video. Now back to the regularly scheduled program. So how much will the new Ranger set you back? Well, it's gonna start at $34,265 for 2024. You'll have to forgive my notes here because Travis and I were not quite prepared for the winter weather. Of course, I was a little bit more prepared than he was. I'm hoping that he's not gonna freeze behind the camera there. At any rate, that base price is a little bit higher than some of the competition, but not when comparably equipped. The Ranger, the body is only gonna come this way. This bed length, which is a little bit shorter than some, and this cab, which is bigger than the base cab that we find in the Tacoma or the Frontier. So definitely keep those reference points in mind. A Tacoma with this approximate bed and cab setup, it's gonna be $35,195. So actually a little bit more than this. And we all know that there's gonna be more of an incentive on the hood of this after probably the first model year. So right now, local dealers are already advertising the, the uh, uh, Rangers that they have coming in inventory soon. None of them have any cash on the hood, but give it nine to 12 months or something like that, we probably will see about $1,000 off like we saw in 2023. Now, if you want the 2.7 liter turbo, that's gonna be at least $36,705 for the XLT trim, then the 2.7 liter option. We don't know pricing on that engine yet, however. But according to the pricing charts that we see on the Ford Bronco, it's probably gonna be about a $2,000 option, maybe about $1,900 or so. That's going to put this definitely less expensive than the Tacoma Hybrid. Most folks assume that the Tacoma Hybrid, we don't know pricing on it yet, it's probably going to be around forty-four dollars to $45,000. So keep in mind, it's going to be a bit more expensive than this. Also, direct competitor would be something like Chevy Colorado. $34,545 is the base price on that model if you want the higher output version of the 2.7 liter engine under its hood. Keep in mind, of course, that's not a six cylinder engine like you'll find in this 2.7, it is a four cylinder engine. So it's gonna sound very much like this one, not gonna give you as much power as we find out of the 2.7 under this hood, but it is gonna give you a bit more pep than this engine. Of course, if you wanna get a Raptor, it's gonna be a lot more expensive than this particular model, but stay tuned because that video is coming up in two days. I have to say, I like the entire package of the Ranger here. I like the look. I also like the practicality. If we come around the back here, the cargo practical features that we find in the Ranger are really what do it for me. The nice touches like blind spot monitoring well integrated into these rear tail lights, the fact that you can tow. We have a lot of the same tow technologies rather that we find in the F-150. Obviously every entry in this segment can tow, but we have the 360 degree camera system. We have the trailer backup assist. We have the nicely integrated trailer brake controller, not an aftermarket knob like we find in some of the competition, well integrated side steps there and the widest bed in the segment. For me, that's a big, big deal. I think a lot of folks out there that are shopping for a truck, especially folks that have complained that trucks have gotten so big, one of the reasons that even if they don't want a big truck, they keep buying an F-150 or a Ram 1500 or a Silverado is because the bed in midsize trucks is just too narrow for a lot of folks in North America. And this Ranger has finally solved that problem. They did that by moving the suspension components, the dampers to the outboard side of the frame. They used to be inboard previously, and that really pinched things in in the back. They've rearranged things, they've widened the frame out, and they have made the bed significantly wider. You can see the bed opening here is actually over 50 inches, and then between those wheel wells, it's just over 48 inches. So we get about 49 inches or so of room there. That adds a lot of practicality. We also have a relatively light damped tailgate. It makes loading cargo pretty easy. Things like the bottle opener, things like that, all that's integrated into the tailgate. C-clamp uh, locations right there for clamping and using your tailgate as a work surface. This is finally a solid alternative to a half ton truck in America for someone that wants something easier to park. It's only about 210 inches long. So it's about a foot shorter than the longest version of the Tacoma, but right in there with the bulk of the competition in this segment. Now, obviously the one big reason you'd still want an F-150 or a half ton truck is gonna be right back here in the rear because you just won't find as much rear passenger room in this as you find in the competition. And I will say that if you're shopping for a Ranger, you should probably also look at a Maverick unless you need the extra towing capability 
The Maverick is shockingly similar in terms of its interior dimensions. The bed is narrower in the back, but it's not that much shorter. And a lot of the difference in size really comes down to the hood length. The hood is shorter in the Maverick. That's where some of that difference comes in, but it's only about 10 inches overall shorter than the Ranger. I think that the one-two punch that Ford has in this segment with the Maverick and the Ranger really answers the question of why there's no hybrid in this model. If you want a hybrid and you want actual good fuel economy, get the Maverick. If you want a hybrid that's more towing focused, more off-road focused, that would be, of course, in the Tacoma. If you want less expensive entries, that's gonna be the Frontier. One of the best well-rounded entries is gonna be this. If you want the most off-road expression in this segment, that's clearly gonna be the Gladiator. Let me know what your pick would be. I think mine is gonna be the new Ranger. Let me know what you think about all that. Find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And then uh, shout out, Travis, what's your top pick in this segment? Funny you should ask, Alex, because I'm gonna go on either end of the very different spectrum. If it's my everyday, I only get one, I'm absolutely going with the Honda Ridgeline. I know that's going to be a controversial pick, but I have had one in the past and I would love to drive one on a daily basis. If I needed something a little more trucky, and that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, I probably wanna go the Gladiator just because of how unique that is. It doesn't mean it's better than this. This is an incredibly well-rounded machine, but the nice thing is that there's a truck for everyone and you get to decide which one works best for you.